welcome to session three of Be Prepared. In session one, we looked at how Jesus sat on the colt of a donkey and was brought into Jerusalem. We looked at the journey of him coming into Jerusalem. In session number two, we looked at what the meaning of Zion meant and the implications of that both past and current and future. And we ended the session looking at what did the fullness of time hold for the generation when Jesus was alive? That generation, what did the fullness of time mean for them? And we finished our session with the reading of Luke on what happened as Jesus has sight of Jerusalem and he begins to cry and uh, the Passion Translation says he burst into tears with uncontrollable weeping over Jerusalem and all I can say to that is the passion of God the passion of Jesus Christ for the people the very people that had rejected him he had not one emotion of judgment but he cannot change the course that man sets for himself man has to do it man has to turn to god god didn't sin man did god has made the way open for man to change course and so we see that the people of that day did not recognize the day of their visitation sorely so and because of that they saw the day of their devastation and we have something to learn from that that now is the time in which God moves. God moved in the past, he will move in the future, yes, but now is the power of God. And God is visiting us now. And we have to recognize the day of his visitation. Or we will be like the people that we're about to read about. So our reading is taken from Matthew 21 verses 12 onwards when Jesus comes into the temple. So he cried over Jerusalem when he has sight of Jerusalem but now he comes into the temple and this is what happens and I'm going to continue to read from the Passion Translation. So Matthew 21 verses 12. Jesus went directly into the temple area and drove away all the merchants who were buying and selling their goods. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the stands of those selling doves. And he said to them, my dwelling place will be known as a house of prayer, but you have made it into a hangout of thieves. Now, <laughs> this is an extraordinary, extraordinary setting. He comes into the temple and try visualize this. He just starts turning tables over. The surprising thing about this is this isn't the first time it has happened. So I'm going to take you back to the first time that it has happened. And rather than retelling, um, I'm going to use the little booklet that I have written, which is available to you all. It's called The Seed of Faith. And if you'd like a copy, you can have a copy. Just let me know. And I'm going to read some excerpts 
that I wrote there, um, sometimes I think I write a lot better than what I am able to speak, but never mind. So I followed the timeline of the earthly ministry of Jesus, and I discovered that his first disciples believed in him after the first miracle that he had done at that wedding in Cana. It's interesting that as Jesus starts his public ministry, his first miracle is at a wedding in Canaan. And in chapter 24, Jesus is going to talk about a wedding. So there's a correlation here. And let's just keep in mind that the Son of Man came because God wants a family. The bridegroom is going to come for his bride. The first time he came, he came to birth each one of us, to make us, as he rose from the dead, we are now recreated in Christ. So he turned water into wine. That was the first miracle at that wedding. Not long after this, Jesus and these first disciples go up to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Now, if someone doesn't know what Passover means, it's an annual holiday or holy day. And look how fast I said holiday. Because in many ways, holy days have been turned into holidays. The holiness of the day long forgotten. On this holy day, thousands of Jews would come to worship in Israel and from around the world, people who had accepted faith, they would come to Jerusalem and there they came to perform certain rituals for the forgiveness of sin by offering the life of an animal in substitution of their own. Now, if you read historian uh, Josephus, he gives eyewitness accounts of the customs and practices of Jewish belief at the time. And he estimates, and I find this so hard to compute, but he estimates that 265,000 animals on average would be sacrificed at the temple daily. Now, I can't compute that, but Josephus says that. Can you imagine the hustle and bustle of families with their bleating animals crawling along to come to the priest who'd inspect the animal to make sure that this animal was without blemish as required by the law of Moses. They weren't going to turn this thing into a mockery. It was meant to be serious. It was meant to be sincere. And so we see that for the first time that Jesus cleanses the temple, he comes into the temple courtyard and it says here in John 2, verses 14 to 21, he noticed it was filled with merchants selling oxen, lambs, and doves for exorbitant prices, while others were overcharging as they exchanged currency behind their counters. So Jesus found some rope, and made it into a whip. 
Then he drove out every one of them and their animals from the courtyard of the temple, and he kicked over their tables, filled with money, scattering it everywhere. And he shouted at the merchants, Get these things out of here. Don't you dare make my father's house into a center for merchandise. That's when his disciples remembered the scripture, which is Psalm 69 verse 9. I am consumed with a fiery passion to keep your house pure. Can you imagine that scene in our days? Can you imagine Jesus coming into churches in a sort of inspection, just as he did into the temple courtyard? But there's more than meets the eye as we read. I'm going to continue reading from my little booklet. And because the thoughts there are quite concise. And I want to make a point that as Westerners, we don't really quite understand what was taking place that day. Um, and as animal lovers, we may even got the, get the wrong impression, you know. Why did they have to kill so many animals? But this was his first public confrontation with religion. Jesus wasn't there to object to the rituals of sacrificing oxen, lambs or doves in substitution for one's own sin. This was necessary and part of the law of Moses as given by God. Over the centuries, these sacrifices had been intended as an act of faith, as a pre-enactment of a real sacrifice of the anticipated Lamb of God that would save the world of its sin and death. In this open confrontation, Jesus objected to far more than extortion in temple tax or exorbitant charges in the sale of sacrificial animals. All of that was going on, but that's not what he's objecting to the most. Above all, he objected to man downgrading God's image, purposes and plans to the faithless realm of man's self-entitlement and self-interest. The religious establishment of the day had made it their business to profit from God's interests while denying to all the knowledge of God's favour Jesus came cutting across all that understanding and way of life to show us the way to the Father in spirit and truth. Now, let me explain to you, by God's design, that temple wasn't Solomon's design just as the tabernacle of uh, Moses had not been by Moses' design, it had all been by God's design. So by God's design, the courtyard was intended as the prayer space for all non-Jews, the Gentiles, people of all the nations that they may have a place and a space where they can come seeking salvation in the God of Israel. So it is serious that God made provision for the nations, but what we find here 
is that the ritual and the way things are done have crowded out the space and the place and the opportunity for the nations to come and pray. Man's priority took priority over that which God had established. And so we see that political expedience. Remember, Jerusalem is now occupied by Rome. They have to pay taxes. The temple is used by the Jews, yes, but they have to pay taxes. And so political expedience and pragmatism prevailed and what you see is that the ruling classes and chief priests had found ways to further their personal interests while profiting from animal sales and the rent of the courtyard spaces. The merchants paid rent to come and sell. There was temple tax going on. Merchants seized the moment to make money. All were complicit in crowding out God's purpose. And so what we see is that the word was made flesh and came unto his own and his own did not understand him, did not accept him. And when the word made flesh came into the temple, it wasn't the first time that Jesus was walking in the temple because we know that when he was 12, he had gone to the temple. But now, filled with the Spirit of God, having begun his um, ministry, he comes to the temple, the word made flesh. He's been tested by the devil in the wilderness. He has overcome and now he comes anointed by God in his ministry. He comes and he inspects the temple requiring accountability. They weren't ready. That was the first confrontation. So the charges of extortion and racketeering to our 21st century mind might even seem reasonable that the service providers should have a space, especially given the a multitude of animals and processing all of these animals. So um, maybe, uh, you know, accessibility closer to the place where the sacrifices must take place, maybe it could be um, sensible. It could be sensible to a natural mind. But our natural minds on no measure to judge God and his purposes. And we need to understand that nowadays many people judge God by their standard of what is right and wrong. And they forget that their standard of right and wrong first is based on themselves, what they find, is right and they feel they are right in and our measure the measure of man is vastly inadequate to measure God and you don't need to be very uh, intelligent to figure that out God cannot be measured by man Ma man is created by God Therefore, we cannot judge him by our standard. What we do need to do is humble ourselves before him because he has a standard, he has a purpose. And we need to fall in line with that 
he's not going to fall in line with us. You know, standing on a railway line uh, or track and a high velocity train is coming towards you, you know the end result of that. The train's not going to stop because you standing there. The rail track was created for the purpose of that train coming down that track. God has a purpose with this world. And that purpose will be fulfilled. And it's for us to adjust, find out, understand, get ready, prepare to align ourselves with his purpose. Not think that we're such a big shot that he's got to align us himself to our standard of what's right or wrong. But anyway, let's face it, the people in those days, they thought that their duty rosters and their cycles of the annual calendar were sufficient. The animals were being killed, so that was sufficient. No, it wasn't sufficient because those acts required faith and faith had long left the building. Faith is what connects us with God, whether it be in the past, Old Testament or currently now. It is by faith that we are saved, not by our works and it wasn't by their works of killing animals on their behalf sacrificing offering up these animals it wasn't in that work it was in the faith that that blood shed on their behalf would be sufficient to cover their sin until next year and that prophetically spoke about the pure Lamb of God that would come to take away the sin of the world for once and for all. But the faith was no longer present. The ritual remained. Religion was in place. And so we see that the design of the Father for the courtyard to be a place of salvation and prayer for the nations had been obstructed and limited to salvation and the privilege of, of salvation being the privilege of a few. And that's not godly, and that's not God. So you can expect what Jesus did. It was more than arriving there and just overthrowing tables. He was going to overthrow the system altogether. And what we find in John chapter 2 is we see that um, Jesus gets hold of some rope and he weaves it into a handle because that's how you make the instrument that he used. You first take rope, you weave a handle and then the pieces that are loose are knotted at the end into a sort of cat of nine ta uh, tails and that's what he used that day to overturn tables and whip the lot of them clean the place up why the father's love for the people of every nation churned in his heart like a volcano ready to erupt. 
Can you blame him? No, I can't. And what he did was right. Unjustly, God the Father had been misrepresented before a generation on earth. And fairly, people had been denied his love and salvation. Jesus was putting an end to it. So now that was the first cleansing. And um, we fast forward three years. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. He's now come into the temple. And repeat, what should he find? He finds the place. <laughs> Again, it is full of the money changers and the they selling and they trading. The first confrontation long forgotten. And so we see that when he overturns the tables the second time round, he says, my dwelling place will be as a house of prayer. In the King James, the New King James, it, is, it says, it is written. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. He confronted the essence of religion in his days. But let's see what happens. This was verse 13. So now Matthew 21 verse 14. Interesting. It starts with the word then. Then happens right after the place is cleaned out. Right after the courtyard has been cleaned up and cleaned out. Then the blind and the crippled came into the temple courts and Jesus healed them all. Isn't that interesting? The first cleansing was because the courtyards were meant as a place of prayer and for the salvation of nations. Second time round, we have another insight. And here it says that the blind, as soon as space had been made, the blind and the crippled come into the temple courts and Jesus healed them all. Now listen. And the church, the children circled around him shouting, Blessings and praises to the Son of David. New King James, the children, were shouting what was being shouted on the way to Jerusalem. Hosanna to the Son of David. Same language, just translated differently into English. Now verse 15. And now it's the grind with religion is about to start. But when the chief priests and religious scholars heard the children shouting and saw and saw all the wonderful miracles of healing, they were furious. Can you believe that? They were furious. You, you have to admit, the house of God was full of imposters. The system not only was corrupt, the system existed for itself. It no longer represented the Father. Yes, they still had rituals going on. But the time, in the fullness of time, their time was up. 
And what we see is that Jesus came and when he confronts what is going on, they are furious. They are furious that space is being made for the nations to be saved. They are furious that the blind and the crippled are getting an opportunity to get saved, to be healed. In their mind, in their hearts, no compassion. It's interesting that when David took hold of the stronghold of Zion, that place which was the fortress of the Jebusites, they intimidated David and they said, no, he will not come up here because of the lame and the blind. All the people that are of no interest, the lowly people, those that are, are not perfect, those that um, are outcasts of society, the Jebusites thought, this is our stronghold. Nobody will come here. But David did not care what they had to say. He took the stronghold of those that kept the blind, the lame, the crippled, the outcasts, and David, did, he didn't kill them. He did something else for them. But that's not my point here. My point here is that Jesus healed all that came to him. Healing, salvation always go together. And not every church even proclaims that. In many churches, healing is banned. Just like healing was crowded out in those days. Could it be that the system has replicated itself nowadays and what we're looking at is a generation of chief priests, religious scholars, Pharisees, just like those that occupied the system in the days of Jesus. Some thought for you to think about. So they were furious that Jesus would come up against their system, against their authority against their way of doing things. And so they said to Jesus, don't you hear what the children are saying? This is not right. Jesus answered, yes, I hear them. But have you never read the scripture from the lips of children and infants? You have ordained praise. And immediately Jesus left at once for a nearby village of Bethany where he spent the night. Verse 18, still in the Passion Translation. While walking back into the city the next morning, he got hungry. Well, Jesus got hungry. He noticed a lone fig tree by the side of the path and walked over to see if there was any fruit on it. But he found none. He only found leaves. So he spoke to the fig tree and said, You will be barren and will never bear fruit again. Instantly, the fig tree shriveled up right in front of their eyes. You talk about the power of God. 
I mean, the tree could have decided, I'll take that, I'll just have leaves. But instantly, the tree created for the purpose not of bearing leaves, but of bearing figs. When the Lord of glory speaks to it, it recognizes the Lord of glory and the life that had in, been imparted to creation by the Lord of glory. When Jesus said those words to the tree, the life in that tree ceased because the whole of creation, God spoke life into the whole of creation. So when Jesus says, no more fruit from you, the tree has no more purpose. It's over for the tree and it knows it can die. But some people don't know that their place is to be fruitful in the kingdom of God. They're happy to just have leaves on their tree. Instantly, the fig tree shriveled up right in front of their eyes. Astonished, his disciples asked, How did you make this fig tree instantly wither and die? Jesus replied, Listen to the truth. If you do not doubt God's power, and speak out of faith's fullness, you can also speak to a tree and it will wither away. Even more than that, you could say to this mountain, be lifted up and be thrown into the sea and it will be done. Everything you pray for with the fullness of faith, you will receive. Let's just unpack that a little bit. So the disciples find Jesus in a miracle that they've never seen before. Before his, every one of his miracles was healing, raising the dead, giving life. And now the opposite happens. This is extraordinary. So they are astonished. How did you make this fig tree instantly wither and die? By the words that he spoke. When the words that Jesus spoke stopped sustaining the purpose of that tree, the tree had no reason to live. Because the whole of creation lives for the glory of the Creator. And man is no exception. Thinking that, no, I own my own life. I am entitled to my own decisions. And yes, you are to your own choices. Every one of us. But understand that our life we were created for the purpose of his glory. Let me read to you in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. In verse 5 we see, he predestined us to adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. Man sins, but according to the good pleasure of his will. He predestines that all that accept Jesus Christ will be adopted by him, to be his sons. 
Can you have a more loving, forgiving, compassionate, merciful God? The answer is no. Man sins. Man falls. Man rejects God. And yet, he finds a way, a costly way, to himself that man through that means can come back to God and it says that we were created in him predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we should be to the praise of his glory. That is in verse 12. We were created second time round. First time created as offspring of Adam. Second time round we are created in Christ Jesus. Those who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So we were created to the praise of the glory of Christ Jesus. To the glory of God our Father. And so we see that this tree had no more purpose to live. If it couldn't be for the glory of God, it ceased. It would be no more. It would decay. And that would be that. Without the glory of God, that's what will happen to everyone who is not born again of the Spirit born again out of Jesus Christ. They will be no more. I don't want to go into uh, they will be no more in the sense of they go into hell or do they just go into a vacuum. Just to understand that we were made in God's image. God is spirit. Every human being is created with a spirit, a soul and a body. So we are eternal. Whether we think we are or not, but we are. So the tree was not created with an eternal soul, with an eternal spirit. But we human beings have been. And so the Bible tells us in Ephesians that in Christ Jesus we are created, born again. We are made new to the glory of Christ, to the glory of God. So I just want to look at that verse 21 where it says, listen to the truth. If you do not doubt God's power, what was the problem with those priests in the temple, with the hierarchy um, in the temple, what's, what was the problem with them? The problem is they doubted God's power. In lesson two, we looked at how Paul tells the church in um, Colossae, you know, um, in Colossians 2 verses 6 to 7, he says, you are rooted in Christ and built up in him, be established in faith and do not let anyone rob you. 
And then he says, through philosophy and vain deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the elements of the world. What happened in those days? The very thing that Paul speaks about, and I've mentioned this in session two, the philosophy of the day, the deceit that comes through the pride of life. The scholars thought they knew better than the word made flesh because the word made flesh didn't wasn't born in their hallways did not attend their academic lectures they had their traditions they didn't have the power of God. They were jealous of the power of God. And they doubted the power of God. And so Jesus tells his disciples, if you do not doubt God's power and you speak out of faith's fullness, I like the way the Passion Translation, uh, translation puts it. Remember our key word in um, les, uh, session number two was fullness, fullness. There is fullness of faith that we need to aspire to, to pursue. We have to have faith. It's not just belief. Yes, I believe in Jesus. Yes, I believe I'm a Christian. Faith is an active. Faith is active. Um, let me just quickly open to you in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I have another teaching of this, and you can refer to it. It's called Substance, Evidence, and the Prize, and you can find it on the YouTube channel. The essence here is that Faith is active. It's not a passive thing. Faith is what undergirds our hope. The people of Israel had gotten stuck on religion, stuck on rituals. They had lost hope of the Savior for a few moments. One day they had cried out, Hosanna, the son of David is here. They were saying the, the Savior has come. A week later, they no longer were crying it out or believed it. Why? Because they were hopeless as a people in their generation. So faith is not belief. Faith is something that you obtain from God. God gives you faith. It's a connection to Him. And you have faith which undergirds the hope. And who is the hope? God is the hope. God, it says in the Word of God that He is the God of hope. It's not hope in the system. I hope that things are going to work out well. I hope that the Messiah comes one day. I hope that I will be forgiven because I brought another lamb this year. The ritual and the religion had caused them to lose sight of the relationship with God and the faith that they needed to have in God. They doubted God's power. For three years, there'd been countless miracles. 
There'd been more miracles in the temple that infuriated them. Political expediency, pragmatism, prejudice, self-entitlement, philosophy, all these things, the traditions of men, the elements of the world, had crowded out the essence of faith. In the first cleansing, Jesus reinstated the dignity of true worship to all the people of this world, the nations. He opened the space and they took note of it. In the second cleansing, he restored dignity and the blessing of knowing God by healing all whom religion wrongfully accused of being cursed of God. And if you read the Gospels, you will find how Pharisees, seeing the miracles that Jesus did, questions that people asked, like, um, is he cursed? Was the curse from the parents? Why was he in this state? He cleansed the temple as a prophetic act that the time was over. He spoke to the tree and said, no more fruit from you, meaning its purpose was over and because it was not sustained by the glory of God, the tree would die. And it did die. So now what we see is the time, in the fullness of time, the system came to an end. The system that had started with Moses finished. Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God. And in the subsequent uh, uh, chapters, we're going to see how he comes up for inspection. And he is turns out to be the perfect Lamb of God. He goes to the cross and we take it on from there in further lessons. But I want to bring your notice to something very interesting and that is the parallel of that day and the parallel of this day and for that I'm going to read um, in uh, First Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 5 and understand this in the light of what Jesus did by cleansing the temple and speaking to that tree so um, for, uh, sorry it's Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 through 5 but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, Haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Wait a minute. This long list of things is dreadful. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, all the, the, this long list, 
cannot surely finish off with having a form of godliness but denying its power. Exactly what we saw in the second last cleansing, these people were boasters, lovers of themselves, proud. They blasphemed the name of Jesus. They were disobedient and thankful and holy and loving and forgiven. I mean, the list goes on and on. And they also denied the power. They denied the power of God. Let's see what Second Timothy 3, 5, how it finishes. It says there, and from such people turn away. It's not telling us to turn away from sinners. It's telling us to turn away from those that deny the power of God. I'm going to say that again. It's not telling us to turn away from sinners. Jesus never turned away from sinners, but he drove out those that denied the power of God. And we need to do likewise. We need to set ourselves aside, away from those that have the audacity to deny the power of God. We need to not have any relationship with them. Why? Because their influence, their philosophy, their deceit, their traditions, the elements of the world that they carry within them will influence us, will soil us. We cannot walk with religion and expect the glory of God to manifest in our life. Religion brings forth death. It does not bring forth life. And in 2 Timothy 3, Verse 5, Paul tells Timothy and the people, turn away from such people. Stay away from people like this. Thank you.